uh, on a major national public sector IT service for the, for the health service for, for the UK. And one of the comments that was given to us by what, somebody that I know said that this is one of the most complex environments that he's ever seen for Siam. I was on the design team for the UK government Siam Enterprise model, uh, which came out probably about seven years ago now. I've advised many organisations on Siam. I'm the Siam Certification Chief Examiner for Exin, and I'm also a founder member of the Siam Architects Group that created the Siam Body of Knowledge, and I'll refer to that later on. Okay, what is service integration and management, which we abbreviate to Siam, just to get us all on the same page? SIAM is a management methodology that can be applied in an environment that includes services sourced from a number of service providers. The key there is underlined, sourced from a number of service providers. SIAM plays into that environment, and it is a methodology. It's not a framework. It's not um, good practice and that kind of word. It's a methodology. SIAM has a different level of focus to traditional multi-source with one customer and multiple suppliers because it provides governance, integration, assurance, and coordination. They're the key words about SIAM to ensure the customer organization gets maximum value from its service providers. Both of those quotes from the SIAM Foundation Body of Knowledge. If you haven't read that, I recommend that you do. So do you need SIAM? Let's have a, have a look at this one. Many organizations have service management all over the place. Let's say they're all internal IT, so they'll have somebody looking after specialist apps over on the left with their own service management team. Networks may or may not have service management. They've got another team looking after the mainframe, another team looking after client server applications. You've got pockets of service management all the way through the organization, all doing things differently, probably not sharing best ways of doing things, almost certainly duplicating some of the activities, but it doesn't really gel, doesn't really go together. And when SIAM first came about, this is what it was aimed at. The Department of Work and Pensions in the UK, a major government department, wanted to find a better way to run the services. And they came up with what they called SIAM. What they did was consolidate service management into a single shared service. So all the service management and the integration at that level for all those different technology towers was done in one place. That's sometimes referred to as Type 1 SIAM. You don't see it much today, but that's part of the history of SIAM. But if you've got that fragmentation that we just talked about, then you should be looking at SIAM as one of the ways to bring that together to increase the value you get from your IT services. Let's look at another model. This is where an organization has many service providers and many different people running those relationships. So up at the top, we have user departments having direct relationships with external service providers, something like the payroll department, talking with their own service providers directly and not really involving the internal IT capability. We have shadow IT, where the part of the organization just goes and gets their own IT. Uh, I had that many years ago with a marketing department who went and bought some Apple Macs and started using Apple Macs. We had no skill at all with Apple Macs and internal IT. We didn't know they were doing it for a while until they wanted to connect it to the network, and then we found out about it. In the middle, you've got internal IT providing some internal services, but also getting services from different external service providers, and really lots of lines of relationships going on, and no single place, no single place that's coordinating this, leveraging best practice, pulling it all together, coordinating and integrating. So if you're in that type of environment, what you do is you put a service integrator in place. That service integrator provides one point of service integration, integrating the delivery of the services from all those different service providers, whether they be internal or external. This is one of the key features of SIAM. You have one operating model that encompasses all the different types of service provider, no matter what they are providing and where they are fitting in the organization, internal or external. So what are the key characteristics of SIAM? Let's go through that. First of all, it builds on and adapts ITIL and other practices. I remember when I first started talking about SIAM and people said, well, does this replace ITIL? 
And the answer was, no, it doesn't. It leverages ITIL. What about COBIT? Well, it leverages elements of that. It builds on all those practices and frameworks that we've used to and standards, builds them and gives them a different focus. It focuses on applying those, those sources of information in a multi-supplier environment. That's what's different about this. And it really simplifies the complexities of multi-sourcing. The old days when you had one provider, probably internal, one place to go to. That's what you're trying to get back to, the benefits of having single providers without actually having single providers. There are many of them. Try and get over those complexities of all different organizations delivering all in different ways and not talking to each other. Cyan provides the business with a single point of visibility. That's the service integrator. So a service integrator is a single point of visibility for those services, a single point of control, and a single point of accountability to the customer for those end-to-end -end services. When the service isn't working very well, you know where to go to. It's the integrator. Their job is to get those services running and keep them running and keep them working. And one phrase that I sometimes use is one throat to choke. The customer has one place to go to and also one organization to blame when things aren't working. Blame isn't very clever. Blame isn't a very, very positive way to do things. But the service integrator is that point, that one place looking after everything. Now, they can be internal to an organization or external. Where I've worked for the past 13 years, we were an internal service integrator. We belonged to the customer organization but we are a separate entity within that customer organization. You can also have an external service integrator when you pay an outside organization to provide those services, or you can have a hybrid. These are very well explained in the SIAM body of knowledge. Let's look at the different layers of SIAM. Up at the top, we have the customer organization. They are the commissioner. They are the customer. They are receiving the services as well. Now, they have a responsibility in SIAM. Some examples there, business relationship management, owning the overall service portfolio, program management, enterprise architecture. When you go into a SIAM ecosystem, you aren't just throwing everything at somebody called the service integrator saying, there you are, it's all yours, make it all work. The customer organization has a responsibility. They own the strategy. You cannot outsource strategy. We then have the service integrator. They do things like supplier management, supply coordination, end-to-end -end reporting. So the service integrator does integration. But at the bottom, we have the service providers. They're doing the delivery, application development and support, network services, hosting. They can be internal or external, part of the customer organization, a different part, but they have to be seen in this way. You have to conceive these layers and understand who does what in these layers, strategy, integration, and delivery. One key thing there is the service integrator does not do delivery. They do integration. One of the learning points from my organization was in the early days, we tried to do the service provider's job. We tried to do everything because that was our comfort zone. That was where most of our staff had come from. They'd come from delivery organizations. So good example, um, service providers wanted to make a change. In the early days, we had every single change from every provider coming to our change advisory board to say whether they could do it or not, every change. We were running change advisory boards every day, in the morning and in the afternoon, twice a day, each one lasting four hours because we were looking at every single change that the delivery organizations wanted to make, every one. That wasn't feasible, that wasn't sensible, and we soon realized and moved away from that. So the key concept there is delivery is done by the service providers. The integrator does integration. So the service integrator role, one phrase that Gartner used several years ago is they act as the informed customer. They represent the customer to the service providers. They are that interface with the service providers for all things to do with the services. To do that, they have to understand the customer to be able to represent them. So they are the informed customer. Another phrase that's used quite often is the supreme authority. 
Um, imagine children. I use children quite a lot in my analogies. There's a group of children playing quite nicely together, and all of a sudden a fight breaks out over something. Somebody wants a different cake, and somebody has the cake they want. Somebody has to step in and be that supreme authority to take control. That's the service integrator's role. The service integrator are that supreme authority acting on behalf of the customer to make sure the services keep operating and keep working and the service providers abide by the rules and regulations, the requirements that they have to have to follow. But a key one for me and a key concept here, and this is one of the learning points really from the front line, is the service integrator is the broker, a facilitator, a mediator, a concierge. I mentioned that the service providers do the delivery. The integrator is helping that delivery. They are providing the lubricant. They are oiling the cogs to make it all work together. In an ideal world, they have very little to do because everything just works. Now, obviously, the ideal world is never the true world. But please take away one key message from this, at least one key message, this one. That the integrator's role is primarily as a facilitator, a broker, a mediator. They're the ones making it all happen, gluing it all together, providing that lubrication to get everything to work. If you look at the history of SIAM over the last probably 10 years, there's been a variety of different models. Uh, most of them were proprietary to different commercial providers. Um, the big names, the well-known names in IT, who would do service integration for people. They'd often do systems integration as well, which was getting solutions to technically work together. They sort of wrapped it all together. Uh, most of those models were tailored to specific organizations. I mentioned the Department of Work and Pensions. They had a SIAM model, which had shared the common characteristics. It was tailored to that particular customer organization, that particular service integrator, and their particular service providers. And the scope of historic SIAM varies as well, and it still does today. Some customers will say we want our service integrator to um, coordinate financial management as well. Nothing wrong with that. If that's what you want, that's fine. So the scope of SIAM does vary. In fact, I've got a colleague that works for one of the major commercial service integrators who says that every time they take, they take a new deal, the scope is different. There's nothing wrong with that. Please take that as a learning point as well. SIAM is not one thing. It is not one size fits all. It does not come on a CD you can plug in and say, right, we're doing SIAM now. It is a concept with various elements in there, various structural, ele structural elements, ways of working, processes, etc., that you bring together in the right way for that right particular time for that customer, those service providers, those services. It can vary every time and probably should. It has a common core. So all these SIAM models have a very common core, many based on ITIL. ITIL's been around a long time. It is what we use for IT service management. But some of them based it too much around ITIL. They tried to apply the body of knowledge from ITIL to a multi-supplier environment without thinking through what it means for multiple suppliers. The example I use for Change Advisory Board, that didn't work when we had multiple suppliers, so we had to rethink that and reapply and reinterpret. But all these models have common themes. And those common themes have been written up into the science body of knowledge. So what are those common themes? The first one is be very clear about roles and responsibilities. When you have a single service provider, you know who does what. When you have many and an integrator and a customer organization, for each of the process areas that you need to work, incident, problem, change, release, etc., you have to know who does what in which circumstance. One of the key learning points about successful sign from the front line is you have to be absolutely clear about roles and responsibilities and document them and understand them and make sure everybody in that ecosystem understands them. It's no use saying, well, we thought you were doing that. That doesn't work. Now, how you get there is through a sign roadmap, through understanding that, through mapping what you want, through going each process, etc. Very well described in the sign body of knowledge. But you must be clear about roles and responsibilities. Now they can change and will change. You must be prepared for change as well. 
Focus on customer outcomes. We've said that in IT service management for a while. It's especially important in SIAM. This isn't about just contracts. This isn't about just making the IT hum down the bottom. It's about focusing on customer outcomes. It's about giving the customer the impression that there is a single service provider when actually there are multiple ones. The outcomes are very, very crucial here. Now, the service integrator provides coordination, assurance, and governance of service providers. That is a common theme across all SIAM models. A key thing is to enable and encourage collaboration across the ecosystem. You have a bunch of different service providers, many of whom are competitors and compete. You have to find ways to get them to collaborate and work together. Some of that you can do with contractual clauses. You can create a collaboration agreement um, to, to help do that legally. But it's all about human beings. SIAM is about people. People actually like to work together. And there are a few ways that I'm going to share with you that we learned from the front line to make that happen. Another common theme is to integrate processes. There is not a single process that runs across everything. You don't have a single incident management process. Can you imagine if one of your providers was Microsoft and you tell them, we'd like you to use this incident management process, please? You can imagine what the response would be. SIAM is about integrating processes at process interfaces, not creating single end-to-end -end process, processes. It's about integration. Talked about the SIAM body of knowledge a few times now. Um, we created that last year, sourced from a range of experienced SIAM practitioners. It had views from different parts of the SIAM, SIAM world, if you like. Um, large vendors, small vendors, customers, uh, practitioners. I was part of that as well. It's non-proprietary. It is, it is open in that true sense. Uh, it doesn't align itself, force itself down a particular technology line or particular uh, service providers or particular service integrators way of working. It's non-proprietary. And it really does give comprehensive foundation level knowledge about SIAM. We're currently working on the next level of that, the professional level, a professional level body of knowledge. But the SIAM body of knowledge that's available today gives you that really good comprehensive spread, had very good feedback. And the key thing is it's free. It is free to download. Go onto the Scorpism site, register, you can access that free. It is a very, very good body of knowledge for SIAM. Any questions so far? Yes, there are a few coming in. I'll just uh, raise a few. So um, you've uh, already talked about a few examples, but are, are there any good examples of implementations of SIAM, SIAM practices? Could you repeat, please? Are there good examples of implementations of SIAM practices? Good example of science practice is the, 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 the health service where I used to work, um, now called the Health and Social Care Information Center. We integrated over 150 different service providers providing critical 24 hour by seven um, system, um, systems into the UK health service. There are a few articles I've written about that. Um, one of the issues with time is very few people write up what they did. One of the other good ones was Bank of Ireland, who won an award at the IHSMF UK Awards last year, who did an integration of both internal and external service providers. There are quite a few out there now. Um, the trick is trying to find them to see who's written up what. Um, but there are several small organizations, large organizations in between. There are also, um, I know of some not so good implementations. Um, I'm not going to give any names, obviously, and people don't shout, about, shout out about those. But there are some because they didn't use the advice generally that has been available now for a couple of years um, and is also in the body of knowledge and some of which I cover, cover later on. Okay. And then uh, there's one question also coming in. Uh, do you manage contracts in SIAM? You absolutely do. Um, mm -hmm. I'll talk later about how... You, should, you shouldn't just rely on contracts. Just waiving a contract is not an effective way to build good relationships. But SIAM is underpinned by contracts. The way that contracts work with SIAM is that the customer organization holds the contract with the service integrator, if that's external. But the customer organization also holds the contracts with the service providers. 
This makes it different than the old traditional prime model where you'd contract with somebody like, say, IBM, for example, um, and they'd then subcontract all the bits to someone else where you only had a single contract with IBM. That isn't Siam. That's a prime contract arrangement. So in Siam, there are contracts, and you have to do contract management. And typically, the service integrator does the contract management, the routine contract management of that, um, particularly the service level adherence, but also meeting any other obligations and checking they're being met but then refers to the customer if they need to escalate. So if you need to send any warning notices, typically they come from the customer organization because they hold the legal relationships. Okay. And then I think uh, one more question. How technical educated should the service integrator be? Oh, how technically? <laughs> Good question. Um, I'm going to give the standard answer. It depends. Uh, SIAM isn't about technology. Um, most of what the integrator does is about processes. It's about management processes, the ones that we know from IT service management generally with a different flavor and contract management and a bit of procurement management. They have to have a technical awareness. Remember, they're not providing the services. The service providers do that. So do you need to know the inside outs of a particular um, Serve on disk technology? Probably not on a day to day basis. But what we found, and what I found, is it's very useful to have somebody with that technical knowledge that the integrator can call on. There are certain okay. specific times when you need that. One is when you're helping um, to run a major incident that involves multiple service providers. You need someone that needs the technical knowledge. Other ones are when you're evaluating releases, um, technical knowledge there. So you need some at the right level, but it's more the focus is more on processes and management and less so on technology. Okay. Do you want to take more questions, or shall we leave uh, the shall rest we go at the end? Gone, and we'll, yeah. take, we'll take the rest at the end. All right. Okay. So I'm going to take some more lessons now and divide it into the fairly traditional structure, process, partners, people, and products, just to give it some structure. Process, where do you start? You should start with a service catalog and portfolio. How on earth can you expect to integrate services from service providers unless you know what the services are, what the boundaries of those services are, who provides the services? You can't. So one of the first things to do when you embark on a journey to move to a Siam way of working is to look at your services. What services do you have already? What services would you like? And think about a hierarchical structure, the business service at the top, the services that the customer receives, the technical services that underpin that, and the people services, the service desk. Um, I've had some fundamentalists shout at me when I've said the service desk is a service. They tell me it's a function because ITIL said, uh, very good, but it is also a service. A service desk provides a service part of that SIAM ecosystem. So the first journey the first step in the journey has to be to create that catalog of services and who is doing what and the characteristics of the service, what hours do you want them to run, how critical are they. Everything that you got taught about on your service management courses about service catalogs and portfolio, you need to apply and use. Now, that graphic underneath is nothing to do with IT service management. It's just showing a hierarchical view of services. But that's the kind of view you need to build. If you don't have that list of services that you want to operate, you should not be engaging a service integrator and paying money for them, unless you're doing that as part of the journey to help build that service catalog. So you must start with a service catalog. The key there is to understand the boundaries and dependencies between services. Technical dependencies between services will give you traffic in service management. Service A, service B have no technical relationship. If you have an incident with service A, you will never need to ask the provider, the provider of service B to get to join in with that resolution because there are no technical dependencies. So as well as the services, you need to understand the technologies here at this stage. Understand the boundaries and dependencies. What relies on what? What passes what to what? And understand the characteristics of each service. The service hours, the service criticality, everything that's out the body of knowledge for ITSM, you need to find out about those services. 
once you've found all that, the next step in your implementation is to go process by process and say, right, what information needs to pass between the different service providers? Pick, pick a process, capacity management. Single provider, capacity management, you take the demand and the forecast from, from the customer organization, you give that to the technical provider, and they provision the right amount of capacity. In the multi-provider environment, the demand stays from the customer, you get the demand, but how are you going to again give that to the service providers? Which service providers need what types of information? Some will need to know the number of transactions that the customer is expecting to process. Some will need to know the number of users. Some will need to know something different. And each provider will probably have a different approach to what they need from that. But you have to work through, in that example, that capacity management process with the service integrator with the facilitator and each of the service providers to define what information do they want and when. And this comes back to documenting and understanding roles and responsibilities. Process by process, look at the exchanges. Not an end-to-end -end process, look at the exchanges because that's what's going to need to flow when you're live in a SIAM model. Some key service integrated process areas. I mentioned we learned the hard way because we were doing this, first of all. Coordinating. You coordinate major incidents and problems. So a lot of users phone up, the service isn't available. Um, you, you start off with a service provider that reported it, and they say, oh, well, our bit's working. Um, it can't be us. But the users are still experiencing a system that isn't available. So what do you do? You need to bring in another service provider who's part of that technical chain, say networks, to get them to investigate as well. Now, in that situation when you have a major incident system not available, the integrator has to coordinate the investigation, coordinate the resolution, and the same for the underlying problems to resolve those. Somebody has to. Otherwise, it isn't going to happen, is it? No one's going to take part and coordinate. But that's coordinating with the service providers as well. That's just one example. I mentioned change management earlier. Changes that affect multiple providers should go to the integrator because they have to broker that change. Their role is to consult with everybody to make sure they have been involved, all the different providers, and are okay with that particular change. The same for releases, the same for deployments. Integrated change management, I mentioned that one earlier. Release scheduling, part of the releases, capacity management. End-to-end -end service continuity testing. Each provider will probably have their own continuity for their particular service to get that back and running. But somebody has to own the overall plan that says when that isn't available, what happens to the others? Can they go to an alternative hosting provider, etc.? Coordinating is a key process area, and you must focus on that coordination, not the doing. Service providers do the processes. Service integrator coordinates the execution of those when it involves multiple providers. Introducing new services, service introduction and acceptance. You need to think about bringing in a new service. And actually, when you go live on day one um, from a, a new model within Siam, you've probably got some services you had before that were running fine. You've now put an integrator in place. But in effect, they're brand new. They're new in this new ecosystem with collaboration and cooperation and coordination. So you have to introduce those services. You have to have a very robust methodology for what you need to look at. So um, do all the parties understand about this new service? Is the service desk ready? Um, all the providers that are involved in the chain, have they trained all their staff if they need to? Service introduction is a key part of what the service integrator does and acceptance, the good part of that, saying yes, it's ready to go live. We mentioned contract earlier, very good question. Process and contract governance. Somebody has to be ultimately accountable this is the, the concierge as well as the supreme authority. So the service integrator focuses a lot on process and contract governance. Is everyone doing what they should be doing? And consolidated service reporting as well. One report for the customer. Why should a customer get 12 different reports from 12 different providers? Don't they really want a consolidated one that shows what that is? 
had one question come in that I'm quite happy to take now, actually. What's the difference between a managed service provider, MSP, and MSI, multi-sourcing integrator? Very good question. I don't actually recognise some of those some of those acronyms, but a managed service provider, in my language, is the is the the service provider at the bottom of the chain. An MSI multi-sourcing integrator. We don't use MSI. We use service integrator as that terminology. The service integrator integrates the delivery of the service providers. We explained that quite well in the body of knowledge. So let's go on to process. SIAM is not out of the box ITSM. Um, I'll talk about tools later, but there are tools that used to say they were ITIL compliant that magically overnight said they were SIAM compliant. Well, first of all, there's no such thing as SIAM compliance. Um, the key is there that SIAM needs adaptation. It is not out of the box ITSM. You're focusing on the integration. Now, if that methodology you're using has is all about integration, great, but not very not very many of them are. End to end and transparent processes are a myth. Now we talk about end to end in the body of knowledge, but imagine a process, an incident management process, um, that encompasses the customer organization, the service integrator, um, a hosting provider, uh, ten different application service providers, a network provider, one the process on one sheet of paper. That's quite a big sheet of paper. I have seen SIAM implementations that try to do that. They spent a lot of time building end-to-end -end models um, that did them no good because they didn't think about the handoffs and the integration, they just thought the end game was a big sheet of paper with lots of processes. Focus on the interfaces, focus on the outcomes. Interfaces are the key here. Coming back to the question about MSP and MSI, a managed service provider is precisely that. How they run their incident process internally is up to them. How they run their release process internally is up to them. However, when they need to engage with another provider, that's when they reach out to the integrator and that's the interfaces that you should focus on. The information exchanges between one provider and another provider, one provider and the integrator, one provider and the customer. Another question came in, I spoke about methodology, how to build that, where to start and what all to cover. I could do an entire webinar just on that, uh, so I really can't spend much time on it. My advice is read the SIAM body of knowledge. There's a section in there called the SIAM roadmap, which gives you a very good template for how to go about that, how to build, where to start and what all to cover. The key thing about processes is document flow, roles, responsibilities for each process at the right level, not end-to-end, -end, not detail. Who does what? So imagine a draw a box around that particular process for supplier A, service provider A. What do they do? Who does what? How does that particular information flow from one to the other? Aim for consistency. Try and keep your interfaces between the different providers and the service integrator consistent but accept that there will be times when you cannot do that. And a key one for that is when you've got cloud providers. Cloud providers, you get what you get. That provider will have its own way of taking incidents. Um, I've seen some SIAM implementations where they thought that they could make all the providers do things in a certain way. You will do this. You will have a service desk with these hours. You will do that and you will do that, that, that. You either spend an awful lot of money because providers will cost you to amend how they work or providers will walk away. But aim for that consistency, but expect a variation in how you do those interfaces between the integrator and the different providers. But know what those differences are because you're documenting them and making sure you know what they are. But also keep it simple. I mentioned the wall chart full of um, incident, incidents from everybody. It's too complex. You can't understand it. Keep it simple. So go for consistency. Go for simplicity. But the key is designed for future change. You will want to introduce new service providers. Technology is moving at such a rapid rate. There will be new ways to deliver apps. We've already seen that over the recent years. You bring your own device and apps, et cetera, et cetera. You will have to change. This is one of the key 
factors to consider when deciding that do you want to do service integration in-house within the customer organization or do you want to give it to someone else to do, pay an external provider? How are you going to make sure that you can do future change that's affordable? If that's in-house, that can be cheaper than going elsewhere. There are lots of other considerations, though, about where you place that service integrator. Uh, again, I could spend ages on that. These are also well covered in the body of knowledge. People. People, relationships, and culture make SIAM work. Good SIAM environments have a very good culture, and I'll give one example of that culture. In my organization, um, one of my bosses, been there a few years, he left, he was the head of service, he left at his leaving party. Not only did he have his own staff there, we had staff there from all of our service providers because they were friends, they were colleagues. We were all part of one ecosystem, all looking at the same outcomes, working together, sharing things together, and building that strong culture. Effective SIAM is probably 80% about people, relationships, and culture, and 20% about all the other stuff, processes and contracts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You need a very working together culture. If you look at Japanese manufacturing, um, I came from manufacturing industry, and the ethos there was that you need all the providers. They all have to work together. If they don't work together, then the whole thing doesn't work. Something about skills. Your service integrator, the key staff there, the process owners in the service integrator, need high skill levels. They are dealing with service providers, some of whom are big, large commercial entities. They have to be able to stand their ground knowledgeably. So in their process area, you need specialists. You need a, somebody that's specialist in release, somebody specialist in incident and change, etc. Yes, you can have one person doing multiple process areas, but your key service integrator staff need to have high skill levels but not only technical skills. This is more about the softer skills, negotiation, persuasion, influencing, all those soft skills. They're what make SIAM work really well. Knowing how people tick, understanding transactional analysis, lots of techniques available around that, around how to, to manage different people and different teams, how to build teams. That's another important soft skill there. So effectively, your service providers are all part of a multi-source team. And the key there is to earn, build, and maintain trust at every level. You need trust. In the early days, we didn't trust our providers in our previous organization. That's why we wanted to see every single change that they did. We didn't trust them. That was unfair, unjust, and wrong. All that did was drive resource in the integrator and delays. We learned, you earn, you build, and you maintain trust. You don't point fingers. If you have an outage, it's not, ah, oh, it was supplier A's fault. That's not what you tell the customer. Actually, um, no fault, it failed. And everyone was responsible. The integrator has a responsibility. They are the throat to choke. So you have to earn, build, and maintain trust. Partners, they are your providers. Flow down responsibilities and activities. The integrator should not think that they do all the work. If you are moving to a SIAM journey and you have an integrator that comes along and says, ah, oh, yes, you should flow up all the activities. The integrator should do every single change and all the incident management and all the release management and all the problem management for all the providers. I'd suggest that you really consider whether they're the right integrator for you. Best practice, SIAM, is all about flowing down responsibilities and activities to an appropriate level and the integrator stepping in where required. That needs empowerment. All against roles and responsibilities and documented, understanding who does what. But empower, don't constrict. Let managed service providers provide a managed service. Empower them to do what they should do, but also make sure they do that integration where you need them. Call you when they have a major incident because you may need to get involved, for example. And it's all about building that supportive multi-provider culture. There are lots of bodies of knowledge out there uh, about building teams and teamwork. They all come into play in SIAM. Uh, and one really effective way we found to do this um, was to have a party. We, we quite regularly used to go out playing 10-pin bowling between all the service providers to get to know people in an out-of-work environment so you can build that trust. 
One very powerful technique that we came up with was the peer-to-peer -peer relationships. So you have your service integrator, you have your problem management process owner, and he builds relationships with the problem management process owners in each of the service providers. So you're creating horizontal relationships. Special interest groups is another, another term that I've seen used for that. Um, and some of the things you can do with that, we wanted to do capability maturity assessments of each process area to see how we were doing. Rather than the integrator saying, this is how we're going to do it, providers fill in this template, we got some working parties together. So capacity management created a working party. That working party working group worked on creating a capability assessment for capacity management, sharing all their knowledge, because there's a good amount of expertise in those providers and the integrator, to come up with a really good way of doing it. And what they'd do is they'd, they'd self-mark, and we'd then anonymize the results, and the integrator would publish those. And the organization that had a not-so-good score in one area realized it was them, and when we were really successful, they'd actually talk to their colleagues in other providers about how they could approve. So this is creating special interest groups, um, working parties, etc., but on a process-by-process -process basis, a very, very powerful technique we found for getting providers to know each other and work together. Accepting that some can't, some won't, but those that can and those that will, try and encourage those peer-to-peer -peer ways of working. And be, through that joint team working, you're doing the team building, you're building the culture, and you're building that supportive environment. So tips for effective partnerships. As far as your users are concerned, you're as good as your weakest provider. So that supportive culture is all about bringing the bar up for those that aren't as strong. Uh, we had a very small organization, one of our providers, who was in, in the southwest of England, rural England, who had 10 employees. They had very little experience. They were good at what they did. They wrote systems for, for doctors. Um, but they had very little experience in integration. So rather than just say, you, this is what you'll do, we gave them free consultancy. The integrator provided free consultancy to help that organization understand more about IT service management, it was ITIL at the time, and about how to get better maturity in some of those process areas. That's the kind of thing you should be aiming at, building that capability, building that maturity, helping each other. I mentioned not letting the service provider do the service provider's job for them. It's so easy to do because your staff tend to be from a background from a service service provider. Oh, well, we'll well, this is how you should do it. Help, suggest, facilitate, but don't do the job for them. I mentioned a few times cloud providers. Um, you have to understand and adapt to different types of providers, big ones, small ones, commodity providers, cloud providers, um, hosting providers. They're all different. You have to understand those, the type of relationship you want with them, the type of relationship you need with them, and how to fit those in. The integrator has to cope with that variety and flexibility. A one-size-all Service integrator, service integrator with a one-size-all model does not work. The integrator has to understand and deal with that variety. Don't overuse contracts. Contracts are there. Contracts should be brought into play when required. Um, the worst contract is the one that has requirements in that are never policed, because when you come to police it, when things get really bad, then providers go, well, you haven't bothered so far puts you in a very difficult legal position. But don't overuse contracts, use people and trust. We got in the situation where one of our providers would phone us up to say, look, we're having real problems with this. We're probably going to breach the service level, um, just to give you a heads up. And actually, we have helped significantly as well with our people, helping them in particular incidents and get those fixed. And build good personal relationships at all levels, CIO to CIO, head of service to head of service, problem management to problem management. Foster those relationships. Do things deliberately to make those relationships work. And party. I mentioned that already. Um, have fun. I know it's difficult sometimes, the work environment. But you should aim and reward success. 
have parties, have awards, do, do anything like that. And I've seen some pretty good balanced scorecards. Uh, Forex Bank, for example, in Sweden, developed a very good um, reward system where each provider rated the others every quarter on how well they'd been collaborating, and the one with the best score got a prize. Um, think out of the box, think those softer skills, that's how you build that culture. Talk about products. The service integrator needs tools. For many years, we struggled on without tools apart from Excel spreadsheets. That required a lot of rework. Um, for example, taking a forward schedule of change from a provider and rekeying it into a system, that's not effective. So you need tools at the service integration level. That's service management tools, because you are doing elements of service management processes, monitoring tools, reporting, and integration. Let's talk about monitoring for a second. It's very useful, we learned, to monitor the provider systems and the end-to-end -end solution. We put a solution in that had probes um, executing business transactions end-to-end -end so we could see how it was performing across the various technology products. That was so powerful that our providers started using that because it helped them rule in and rule out their particular services when we had issues. Think about end-to-end -end monitoring. It's very useful, very powerful for the integrator to keep an eye on what's happening. Reporting tools. You want to build good reports of the user's experience of the service that can fit in with monitoring, as well as SLA achievement, but you need tools to collate all that. And integration. Think about incident management. An incident comes into the service desk, let's say the integrator provide that, they route it to provider A. Provider A then says, it's not me, I think it's somebody else. You need to route that to provider B. Picking up the phone is not effective. You need to do incident management, integration. You can do that within your tool sets. You can, let's say you've got, I don't know, BMC remedy or something. You can do all the integration in there, or you can now use integration hubs. There are tools out on the marketplace that will do integration between one particular tool set and another tool set. They have the plugins already available, and they can track that as well and audit it. So do your homework, do your investigation around tool sets, but have a look at tool set integration and automation as well. You need to automate routine tasks. An example we had of that is um, every month we get a report in from our providers about the problems that they said they were going to fix. Originally, we had people looking through them saying, hang on, you say you were going to fix that. You haven't fixed it yet. We automated that, fully automated. It looked at due dates. It compared them. It raised an email back to the provider saying, you said you were going to do this by that date. Please give an update. It then raised an alert to the service integrator, person responsible for that, so they knew something was happening. Think about automation. Think about integration. Take all that pain away. But very few tools do service integration out of the box. There are, I think, at least two now claiming um, rightly to have some service integration capabilities. Because all the environments are different for service integration, they will need customization. That's the way of the world. But an awful lot of tools out there are now claiming to be SIAM compliant have just taken off the word ITIL and put SIAM on there as well. Do your homework, again, it says this in the, in the sign roadmap and the body of knowledge. Do your investigation. So, fake news. Um, there is a belief out there among some people that if you're putting a SIAM ecosystem in, you can tell every service provider to adopt the same tool. That's fake news. Very few will do it. If they've got a corporate tool already, why would they adopt your tool as well? If they do do it, it's just going to drive cost and complexity. So be aware that that can be a myth. Um, some more fake news. Every provider will integrate their tool with the integrators. So you put in a contract that you will integrate your tool, and then they don't, and yet they're providing a very good service at a very good cost. What do you do? Terminate the contract? The other fake news tools are SIAM compliant. No such thing. The key thing here is the service integrator is responsible for tool set integration. They have that responsibility. They may need to get technical help for that, but the service integrator has to be responsible for that integration, working with the providers, 
And some providers, this is what, again, one size fits all doesn't work. Some providers will do that in different ways. The integrator is the facilitator that makes that happen, that has responsibility for the toolset integration. So what can go wrong? Lots of things. Unless you really design this and implement it properly, you can end up with worse service than you had before and worse availability. I've seen some organizations that have gone from single provider to multiple providers because they thought that's what the government told them they had to do without really thinking through the boundaries between those services. Uh, and there was a, an idea going around, it's called towers, of having um, hosting different from application development and support, no matter which the application was. I've seen that result in poor availability and poor service quality because you've got too many providers involved, passing incidents around, not working together. It can be the other way around if you do this properly. Increased customer overhead. Um, sometimes customers don't want to let go either. They do too much. But unless you understand what the integrator role is and specify that, you find that the customer keeps having to do things like um, know, finding out the forecast of, of capacity, for example. Your costs can be too expensive. This is partly down to contracting. The service integration marketplace is expanding considerably. Um, costs are potentially coming down. You could end up locking yourself into an integrator contract for several years, and meantime, the costs go down. So you need to be aware of what you're paying for what. The integrator may also quite happily do things for you that should be done by the provider, increasing the cost, or they might be man-marking man the provider, checking everything they do, increasing the overhead costs. That's tied in with the integrator doing too much. The integrator should do as much as is necessary to make the ecosystem work as a whole. If you don't do this right or take too long, or you can, you can burn money. You can spend a lot of money on implementation and operation without really getting the benefits. Some of this is down to how you implement. You can go big bang everything at once. You can pilot with one provider, pilot with one service, all described in the body of knowledge. Um, but you need to make a start. I know one organization that spent two years uh, burning money, getting in people to help them design models without being brave enough to actually start and implement one. You have to have flexibility for change. If you don't design in flexibility from day one, you will cost an awful lot, get an awful lot of money charged for you. You have to be flexible. Providers will come and go. Services will come and go. Technologies will come and go. If you don't design for flexibility and change, you will get lock in and it will cost you more or worse, stop you taking advantage of new technologies and services. And a key one is a service integrator lock-in. One of the reasons for moving to SIAM is to avoid being reliant on single providers for too long, which was the history in the UK government, 10-year contracts, don't move anywhere else because all the knowledge is with them. If you do this wrong, you end up being locked into a service for integrator. And there was a blog by the government CTO, UK government, all about knocking down the towers of SIAM, which he actually wrote in response to many UK public sector organizations being locked into service integrators, not doing what the whole intent was, is to make this flexible and open and flexible for change. Uh, that can cost you a lot of money as well and rule out some of the benefits. Okay, final slide, move to the summary. SIAM isn't one thing. It's a methodology that encompasses a lot of different common aspects, but there's no such thing as a SIAM model. Um, one of my colleagues apparently was talking with someone who said, ah, there are four SIAM models, and he fell off his chair at the time because the answer isn't four or five or two. The answer is there are probably as many SIAM models as there are SIAM implementations, but with common threads that we've described in the body of knowledge. ITIL doesn't do it all, nor does it claim to. Um, no one says that ITIL does it all, but there's a myth that SIAM has just rebadged ITIL. It is more than that. People, relationships, and culture are the key to effective SIAM. Part of that is understanding who does what. You have to build trust. You have to empower time with relationships. But the, really keep it simple. 
If you can't describe your model on a few sheets of paper, how can you expect people to understand it? Keep it flexible because it will change and keep your eyes open. If you're moving to a SIAM way of working, do it with knowledge. Do it knowing what SIAM's about. Get yourself on the SIAM Foundation course to understand more about it. It's a big business decision. Moving from a current way of working to a SIAM way of working is a change. It's a cultural change. It's an organizational change. It's a business change. You have to do that with due diligence and with knowledge. You can't just outsource that. Hello, I want an integrator to come and do all this for me. You can do that. If you do that, then you're probably going to run into some of the issues and some of the risks that I mentioned on the previous slide. Thank you for listening to me. I hope that's been useful. I think we have time for some questions. Yeah, so there's a question coming in um, about the difference between service delivery management and supplier management in the SIAM model. Right, so the difference between service delivery management and supplier management. Um, supplier management is more the traditional way of per the purchasing get involved in. So it's building relationships with suppliers. It's um, when a supplier is not fulfilling its contractual obligations, doing what it says in the contract to make them do it. So that's your supplier management more with a home in the purchasing. Service delivery management is more traditional ITSM, traditional ITIL, where you're managing the delivery of that, doing service level management, for example, your monthly service, monthly meeting against service levels. So there's a subtle difference there. One passes to the other. So using that example of service levels, if there are persistent breaches of service levels and you need a warning letter writing to the, to the, support, to the service provider, that's when you'd pass from service delivery management into supplier management. So supplier management is the higher end, the more, the more complex end of contract management, if you like. Okay. And then is there a maximum amount of delivery parties for managing within the SIAM model? This is a very good question. What's the right or wrong number of the number <laughs> of delivery parties? Um, there's no right answer. Um, we integrated hundreds in my previous organization, um, which was challenging, um, but there were similar types, so probably about five different types. If you've only got one provider, forget I am waste of time. If you've got two, great, but you end up with a, a sweet spot, and there isn't a magic number, but the more providers you have, it's down to technical interactions. The more providers you have with more interactions between their services, the higher the workload for the integrator because the more things like incidents, problems, changes, etc., involve multiple parties. So if you can design your service landscape to absolutely minimize interactions between different applications, for example, then you can cope with far more service providers in that model. Um, it's probably worth doing some research at the point, uh, at some point, about how does it drive costs. I suspect it isn't. I suspect it could be linear. It's down to how you organise the integrator. Um, in the worst case, every time you add a provider, you'll add another five people into your integrator. That can drive significant cost and complexity. But it's all about understanding it, modelling it, making a start, and trying it out. I think gut feel says something like five to seven providers is probably a good sweet spot. Um, but it depends what they are. Remember, providers now could just be providing an app. It's an app. Um, they don't get involved in change management. They don't get involved in anything else because it's just a commercial app off the cloud. They still need integrating. You still need to know who's providing what. So that number could increase, but it really is down to the types and natures of those services and service providers. Okay. And then one last question. We do have more questions, but we're at the end of the hour. So, um, and there are a lot of questions around ITIL and SIAM. Uh, the main one is, is, do you need to be uh, ITIL certified to get a start with SIAM, uh, with your SIAM training? I, I you don't need to be ITIL certified to get a start with SIAM. However, it is very useful to understand the ITIL processes um, to get a start with SIAM. Uh, uh, SIAM isn't ITIL. 
but the foundation of that um, has very com the processes are very common so if, unless you understand incident problem change release capacity etc you will have more challenges in understanding siam so it is worthwhile having an understanding of it whether or not that certification is really down to your own personal choice okay Okay, then um, uh, I think we can all um, gather the questions and we will send out an email with answering the questions uh, that will be sent out next week. We will also, uh, we've also recorded this webinar. We will also send out an, uh, an email around that. And there was also a question around uh, the link to the body of knowledge. So that will be in that email as well. Um, ending that, I really would like to thank, uh, thank you, Kevin, for this great webinar and um, looking forward to have more. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to me.